And by the way, um, don't be afraid to ask questions or interject a comment, hopefully a nice comment. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> As we go along, otherwise you'll, you'll be bored for the next 45 minutes if you just sit there and listen to me uh, talk. Anyway, um, so this is you know, a very quick primer on energy metabolism, right? So um, energy metabolism both from anaerobic glycolysis as well as oxidative metabolism, of course, mitochondria are very important um, in virtually all cells and tissues of the body of producing energy for metabolism. And as I said, I'm very interested in muscle. And for me, when we started doing electron microscopy in, in some of our biopsies, um, it, it was really, I wouldn't call it an aha moment, but it was a moment that really just took me back to, you know, muscle biology 101 and looking at the potential role or the role of mitochondria in, in supplying energy to contracting muscle, right? Because when you look at, um, I think this still works, you know, when you look at a, a video of actin and myosin cross bridge and the electron, uh, or the, uh, you know, the EC coupling in muscle, um, and you look at the ATP release there from the myosin head, okay, ATP is obviously required for muscle relaxation during contraction. And then when you look on the left here, I'll stop this because it's kind of annoying. Um, and you look specifically at where these mitochondria are, they're geographically located exactly where ATP is needed, right at the cross bridge, the Z line of actin and myosin cross bridge, right? So the mitochondria are positioned perfectly to supply ATP for contracting muscle. I know it's obvious, but I think a picture is kind of nice to see once in a while. So as again, I mentioned um, that we do work in the setting of obesity and aging as it relates to um, metabolic disease risk. We've done a lot of work over the, over the years of looking at um, the role of uh, altered body composition, uh, altered fat deposition in obesity and aging. For example, on the upper left, you see a typical CT scan of an older obese person that you see a lot of not only subcutaneous fat around the leg colored in blue, but you also see a lot of the, the marbling of fat in the red and the green there. Um, we termed this many years ago as intermuscular adipose tissue because it truly is adipose tissue. I won't show it today, but we've, um, we've actually done some excise tissue sampling and analysis of patients undergoing surgery, and you can clearly identify adipocytes in, in muscle, um, in different, in different um, muscles of the body. So th these are adip true adipocytes. This isn't just triglyceride accumulation outside the muscle cells. Um, as it relates to, uh, again, metabolic disease risk, insulin resistance, and then what I'm going to talk about more today is really how um, mitochondria might be a nexus for uh, the intersection uh, or the nexus between uh, altered fat deposition of the muscle as well as uh, altered muscle contraction. And then also how does that, you know, physical activity or exercise play a role in this? I'll just say from the beginning that one of the questions that we've had and continue to have is what is really a primary effect of aging versus secondary effect of aging due to physical inactivity and obesity. And in humans, it's really difficult to tease this apart, right? Because as people get older, they tend to accumulate body fat and they become more physically inactive. So it really gets more difficult to determine was it, what is an effect of, of aging versus physical inactivity, for example, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. The other um, sort of paradigm that we've, I guess, promoted over the years that, um, you know, if I was to, to, to get up and, and really be, you know, on a pedestal and be proud of a couple things that we've observed over the years, this would be one of them. And that is this concept that, uh, Sarcopenia in aging is not just muscle mass. I would argue, in fact, that muscle mass is not that relevant in aging and uh, physical uh, function as people get older. And so these data come from a, a, 
epidemiological cohort study that I was involved with going back now since the late 90s called the Health Aging and Body Composition or Health ABC study. So these are data from 3,000 older men and women that we followed over time. Uh, these are three-year change data showing that uh, men and women lose muscle mass, so the classic sarcopenia paradigm, but their loss of muscle strength is about three times greater than we see for their loss of muscle mass, meaning that there's a disconnect between muscle mass and muscle function. In fact, when you do correlations in this large cohort correlating muscle mass and muscle function, they're very weakly correlated. So we've really been promoting the idea, and I think this is in part where the, all, you know, the, the evolution of the sarcopenia definitions have come from, going from just focusing on muscle mass as a definition of sarcopenia, now to including measures of function, and now even gait speed and some other functional parameters. And again, as I said, I think a lot of this aging can be attributed to, and, and loss of function can be attributed to uh, physical inactivity. So this vicious, you know, when you're in this visual spiral downward of physical function leading to disability and aging, it really is difficult to tease apart what is aging versus physical inactivity. And I would argue that uh, aging in some ways, not in all, all things certainly, but aging is, is uh, in disuse or kind of mirror images of each other. Um, and again, our work to really try to disentangle uh, which, which comes first or which is what. So um, these are data that we published last year. Very simple cross-sectional comparison of, um, yeah. How do you show that you have components from the hospital component? We don't, no. neuromuscular activation, including muscle quality. So in those muscle strength changes, obviously in humans, we, we can't, well, I mean, we could in smaller studies, but in these bigger studies, we traditionally have not done a very good job of partitioning out what's neuromuscular activation versus intrinsic muscle properties, right? So we don't know what, what nope. And I would even argue that we, we know even less about central activation. You know, what connects central activation in the brain to muscle movement? And so there's a lot going on there. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, so this study is actually looking at the intrinsic properties of muscle, not considering, um, you know, neuromuscular activation, uh, central command of muscle movement, et cetera. And in this simple study, we simply looked at young um, people, middle-aged people, and a group of older people um, with respect to uh, muscle characteristics, in this particular study, we focused on mitochondria. Uh, with an interest of mitochondria, we wanted to see if there was really, at least in a cross-sectional association or comparison, a difference in mitochondria content and or function in these, in these older people. So obviously, um, you know, the, the body composition characteristics differ. Um, the older people have a low cardiorespiratory fitness compared to the, um, to the young people. And this is an important point as we'll get into some of the, some of the data. Because um, within these groups, these are fairly heterogeneous groups of, uh, of older and middle-aged and younger humans. You got some people that are more physically active than others. So we tried to, to tease that apart a little bit. And so in the biopsies, um, we did a lot of things in these biopsies. Um, for example, we looked at, and I'm going to show some of the data today, on mitochondria respiration with um, high-resolution respirometry. We've looked at um, mostly enzyme activity, protein expression, um, and have done some histology for muscle fiber type and so forth. So when we, when we look at mitochondria content, um, we can use EM for mitochondria volume density, for example, um, and then we can use uh, easier uh, methods like Western blots just to look at protein content of oxidative phosphorylation proteins in the muscle. And then again, we can use this high-resolution respirometry 
um, called the O2K or Oxygraph O2K, uh, this Ouroboros instrument here, in which we take a part of the biopsy, um, typically only one or two milligrams um, of a biopsy. We mechanically tease apart um, the biopsy, um, as you see here. So these are individual muscle fibers, mechanically teased apart from the biopsy. And then we can permeable, or we do permeabilize, uh, chemically permeabilize these muscle fibers with saponin to allow exogenous substrate to penetrate the muscle fibers. So these are intact muscle preparations to look at oxygen consumption um, in response to different substrates. So here, this is basal respiration. Um, this would be state four respiration just with basic substrates without ADP, pyruvate, malate, glutamate, and then you add ADP. Um, and you can, by the way, and we've done this before, we add ADP and in increasing concentrations to look at ADP sensitivity, for example. You look for a cytochrome C in, uh, effect uh, in your preparation to make sure that, you know, cytochrome C is not uh, leaking out and it's not a factor in your, in your analysis. And then you can um, further uh, stimulate with succinate to get a maximal coupled respiration. And then um, with uh, FCCP as an uncoupler to look at maximal uh, uncoupled respiration. So the advantage of this technique, and as you can see over time, we can do like an hour up to, you know, hour and a half protocol with different substrates and inhibitors um, to look at the different respiratory states, you can look at complex one versus complex two respiration, et cetera. And then separate protocols, you can look at fatty acid substrates. So you can look at both carbohydrate supported as well as fatty acid supported mitochondria respiration. And so in this cross sectional study, um, I won't take you through every single piece of data because I think the message is fairly consistent and clear. That re whether you look at basal respiration, complex one or complex two respiration, complex one pl plus two, um, as well as maximal uncoupled respiration and, and coupled respiration, you essentially see that um, when you divide these subjects into just young, middle age, and old, it has a significantly higher mitochondria respiration. Um, but the cursor is a little bit, if you don't, that's okay. I'll continue to use this. It'll just be easier to, there, I can, I can show this. Just some, sometimes my arrow doesn't work too well, sorry. But what I want to draw your attention to is these two bars here. So these are young active subjects and these are young sedentary subjects. When you separate out the young active versus young sedentary, you don't see an aging effect at all. In other words, so the older group, middle age, and young sedentary are all the same. It's only when you look at the young active group that you see that they have a significantly... Oh, perfect, thanks a lot. I might need that, Randy. <laughs> So again, it's, it's only when you separate out the young active group do you see this much higher mitochondria respiration. And this is true for some of the respiratory uh, flux control ratios as well, not so much in some of these on the left. And I could get into the detail, but... We don't separate the, the active group and the other age. We just did that. We just did that. Um, we've looked at that data just a couple weeks ago. We haven't published that yet. So I'll get back to that point in a second. Um, um, some, there's some interesting things about these respiratory control ratios. For example, when you look at the ratio between maximal coupled respiration and basal respiration, it's almost like a uh, respiratory reserve capacity. Going from resting to maximal as a capacity is recapitulated in some of these ratios. The point here is that there is really no age association in mitochondria respiration in muscle, but it's really driven by the physical activity. And so the question is, why didn't we have an old active group? We didn't in this study, but now we do. And I can tell you that the, young, the old active group is right there, right with the young active group. I was just telling somebody earlier, I think today, that when you look at uh, whether it's mitochondria respiration, 
mitochondria enzyme activity, um, mitochondria content on the EM. Um, there's very little difference between these old active people, particularly like the masters athletes types that are, you know, running marathons and doing triathlons and whatnot compared to 25-year-old athletes. So the point here is that muscle is able to main, you know, be very healthy, um, at least in terms of the respiratory um, capacity up into uh, at least in their 70s. And more recently, and I, I don't have a slide of this today, but we've done these same measures on 90-year-old people, and I can't wrap my head around some of this, but it looks like it might even just in normal 90-year-old people, healthy people, the mitochondria function is actually higher than we see in some of the 70-year-old people. I don't know if it's a survival effect, survival of the person, survival of the muscle fibers that are still there that you're measuring. Um, so, you know, I'm still trying to figure that one out. So, in fact, when we do a correlation of all these subjects with um, age, um, up to about age 90, um, with maximal coupled respiration, there's only a very weak correlation with age. Stronger with BMI, but it's still relatively weak. Um, BMI is up to almost 50. Um, and mitochondrial respiration, you can see there's a clustering down here along the lower BMIs, which is interesting. So what factors other than BMI affect mitochondria? Well, you're probably guessing, like I would, that it's fit physical fitness, right? So VO2 max or cardiorespiratory fitness strongly relates to mitochondria function. And this really makes sense, right? Because this is part of what contributes to VO2 max anyway, your ability to extract oxygen in during maximal exercise. So it would make sense that it's it's more strongly correlated. Um, you, the, the endogenous respiration um, is very low, right? Basal respiration is very low. So you have to permeabilize these fibers to get exogenous substrate in. You can't really see it with endogenous substrate because when you permeabilize the fibers, all the cytosolic contents are removed. So all you're left with are the intact membranes, including mitochondria. So this preparation really dictates that you have to use exogenous substrates. And by the, way, by the way, you can't do this with like seahorse, right? Because seahorse, you can only use cells. You can't uh, effectively use tissue with a seahorse. Yeah? So, is the respiratory function of the mitochondria affected by the whole respiratory process, mitochondria and white muscle fibers versus red muscle fibers different? Oh, yeah. Have you measured that? For sure. Um, <laughs> That doesn't explain it. It's a great question. The question is, does fiber type explain some of this? Because um, type 1, high oxidative, red muscle fibers have a lot more mitochondria. The respiration is higher. Um, but there's no fiber type differences in the subjects that we looked at. Now, there is a fiber type difference in the active people. Um, they have a higher percentage of type 1 muscle fibers. Um, so there's no question that that influences it. But across the sedentary group that I showed, um, you know, old, middle age, we don't see a fiber type difference. Keep in mind also in human muscle, when you biopsy the vastus lateralis, the thigh muscle, it's a mixed muscle fiber type. Um, what we haven't done a good job of in the field of human muscle uh, biology is to try to sample other muscle groups like soleus that might have um, a higher percentage of high oxidative fibers. So we also looked at some uh, proteins involved in uh, mitochondria dynamics, like fission, fusion, and mitophagy, to try to get a better sense of whether some of these age-related changes or physical activity-related changes might be due to, uh, that might be related to function, might be due to, um, you know, the dynamic processes by which you um, get rid of bad mitochondria and incorporate newly synthesized mitochondria, because um, you know, keep in mind that the mitochondria in skeletal muscle 
um, at least the intramyofibular mitochondria is really a reticular network of mitochondria. It's not just distinct mitochondria as organelles, um, but these, these reticulum um, like this, it, it again, would be like, for example, if you wanted to um, you know, get rid of, prune off a section of bad mitochondria, you would uh, implement a process of fission to get rid of this, and then fusion would potentially, theoretically, synthesize new mitochondria back onto this. It wouldn't just be creating a whole new organelle, right? It would just be taking away or adding to what's already there. And so some of the proteins that we've looked at, some of the fusion proteins, and I'll take you through this fairly quickly, because uh, I think you'll get the message here um, straight off, and that is um, OPA1, for example, which is a protein involved in mitochondria fusion. Um, when we look at just young, middle age, and this older group, you see a trend, but a lot of variability, and it looks like a lot of this variability is explained by the young active versus young inactive, because when we separate out the young active and the young inactive, it's completely driven by the young active group in differing in the middle age from the old subjects. So this mitochondria fusion protein is higher with increased physical activity. Mitofusin 2, another one, tends to be higher in the physically active group. Mitochondria fission, so this Fis1 protein, again, higher in the physical active group. Another fission protein, DLP1, tends to be higher in the physical activity group. And these are small ends. These are only, I think, six, uh, here we go, six in this group, 11 in this group. Um, so the point here is not only are mitochondria content higher, mitochondria function, but some of these proteins governing uh, mitochondria dynamics, fission, fusion, and autophagy as well, tend to be higher in this uh, physical activity group. And as it turns out, um, some of these proteins involved in mitochondria dynamics, like Becklin-1 and Fis-1, for example, um, are strongly associated with the function of the mitochondria determined by the high-resolution respirometry. So one of the questions is, okay, so what does this mean with regard to function in older people? Does mitochondria function really relate or contribute to physical function in older people? We've done a couple studies over the past few years to get at this. Um, one of the studies that we did in a group of uh, only about um, 35 or 40 subjects um, is looking at measured gait speed, so self, you know, pref preferred walking speed in subjects. It's been shown to be associated with mortality in, in older cohorts, um, associated with uh, predicted walking speed. And, and this over here is a composite of um, mitochondria function determined ex vivo by high-resolution respirometry, and uh, uh, P31 phosphorus uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, so looking at the ex vivo and in, in vivo mitochondria function, showing that preferred walking speed is highly correlated to mitochondria function within a group of older people. Another study showing that um, in vivo mitochondria function determined by the phosphorus NMR method um, was associated with fatigability. So what we did, we looked at um, older subjects with low fatigability versus high fatigability and looked at um, ATP max either alone or as a function with, um, uh, um, let's see, what is this? Oh, as a function of quadricep volume, so taking into account muscle mass, and showing that no matter if we looked at it with muscle mass or without, that subjects with high fatigability have lower mitochondria function in the muscle. And then this is unpublished data um, from this group of uh, men and women aged 90 to 94. Um, actually, we had a, a couple young subjects, um, 85. Uh, we did a six-meter walk test, and we looked at mitochondria function just simply broken down into low versus high um, mitochondria function, and those with high mitochondria function had higher gait speed. 
And this, you know, it's correlation data and it sort of makes sense, but this is really among the first human data showing that mitochondria in muscle is actually related to function in older people. Uh, we did 42 biopsies in this study. And by the way, these were, these were um, men and women that came back 16 years um, in the Health ABC study. So Health ABC, we started off with 3,000 subjects. 16 years later, there were about a little over 1,000, about 1,000 subjects still living. Um, so we just did a subset of sub subjects who were willing to come in the clinic for a biopsy. Um, and, and did this study. And by the way, um, my first R01 that I ever submitted um, was, a, was a proposal to get, and this was when Health ABC just started, right? So this aging co cohort study in 3,000 subjects, I sent a proposal in to get muscle biopsies and we were going to do uh, mitochondria, enzyme activity linked to physical function, body composition over time. We were going to do genetics. Um, and gene expression and basically follow these subjects to see if these muscle characteristics predicted prospectively function. Got triaged. <laughs> and I was young and naive. I gave up too easy. I should have I kept resubmitting the same grant because every time I go give a talk, people are like, why didn't you get muscle biopsies from these subjects? Well, 16 le years later, we did, but too little too late. No, this is measured. This is what they came in the clinic and actually measured. We measured their walking speed. Okay. Do you have any data when you push them? You push them to make them actually yeah. exercise? Yep. You know, forced exercise, try to run or something like that, whatever. Uh, and, and, and how that relates to this. Yeah, er, early on, earlier in the study, in this cohort, we did um, 400 meter walk speed. Um, we pushed them a little bit, although it wasn't, we did both fast pace as well as usual pace, 400 meter walk. So we did not, you know, we didn't do VO2 max tests on them or anything like that to, to answer your question. Yeah, exactly. It's a good question though. Yep. You mean if you look at the associations in young, do you see it? Yeah, you definitely see it. Right. Well, I don't know if the slope's changing. So, right, I mean, the correlation could have a different slope as you get older. We don't, we don't know. Um, but the point is, mitochondria function is is related to um, you know function in in younger people, and you know this this goes back to you know, in the 50s when they were doing the classic exercise, you know, when they started doing muscle biopsies and people exercising, showing that, you know, muscle oxidative capacity related to, you know, not only VO2 max, but marathon performance and, you know, all kinds of things. So, so this is, it's, it's sort of taken that paradigm except shifting it to a lower, older people and a lower kind of function to see if we still see this correlation between mitochondria function and physical function, right? How do we define those people? Divide them actually? Okay. Okay. So, uh, is that possible that because those people are actually sick or relatively No, they're healthy. Healthy uh, community dwelling people, um, but they're not, you know, they're not running marathons. They're just, you know, they might be gardening and things like that, but they're not exercising per se. Yeah, but they're healthy. Yeah, and they have to be fairly healthy to come in and volunteer for this. So these are also unpublished data for an ongoing study we're right now. I have an R01 right now um, to look at the effects of calorie restriction induced weight loss with and without exercise on mitochondria function and insulin resistance in older people. And so these are cross-sectional um, data from some 
uh, subjects that we've collected so far. And um, let me take you through this. I won't spend a lot of time. But we've measured leg power with isokinetic dynamometry as well as muscle strength. And so these are leg power, leg strength, leg power, leg strength. And we've looked at maximal coupled respiration and uncoupled respiration in biopsies measured with the O2K. And I was actually surprised to see this um, data coming out so strongly correlated because this is really an anaerobic kind of uh, exercise, right? So this is maximal leg strength and power. But as it turns out, it's strongly associated with mitochondria function. In these old, so these are old, you know, men and women in their 70s. Um, I don't know what this means yet, so these are very preliminary data, but I think it's very interesting that not only mitochondria relate to endurance performance, but also muscle strength and power. And then this is another set of data with the endurance performance, at least measured with VO2 max, coupled respiration, uncoupled respiration, and again, very strong association between mitochondria function and content in the muscle with uh, VO2 max. And you can see the VO2 max values go down to almost one. These are about what you would feel, see with chronic heart failure patients. Um, in fact, one of my first papers that I had reviewed and I presented, you know, I reported VO2 max in these 70, 75-year-old people. And one of the reviewers said, these are impossible. These are like heart failure. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. They are. But they're older people. Their fitness can be really low. And then um, much weaker data, but nonetheless, just with four meter walk test. So this is a test. OK, walk across the room four meters at your normal walking speed, not trying to rush, not trying to be fast, but also relating to mitochondria function in the muscle. So we talked a lot about physical activity, you know, high active versus normal active people. So the question is, how does exercise really impact some of these parameters if you um, have people exercise. I mentioned the master's athletes. Here's a micrograph from one of our master's athletes compared to a sedentary person of the same age. You don't need to quantify this to show that this person has a lot more mitochondria. Um, incidentally, a lot more triglycerides in the mu muscle recapitulating the athlete's paradox, showing that they have more stored triglyceride, a lot of mitochondria, a lot of glycogen um, compared to the sedentary person. But if the picture um, wasn't convincing enough, you can actually quantify it on EM and show that they have about double the amount of mitochondria in the muscle compared to sedentary, uh, normal weight, or obese people. And if, and this goes back a few years earlier than that, we did a study back in the mid-2000s showing that if you take 70-year-old people, sedentary people, and have them do a whisk, brisk walking program for just 12 weeks, you see a 50% increase in their mitochondrial enzyme activity with just the walking program. So it's not just the athletes that you see this higher mitochondria, but you can see this pre-post exercise intervention um, in sedentary people. So what about calorie restriction effects on mitochondria? If exercise improves mitochondria, exercise improves insulin sensitivity, weight loss improves insulin sensitivity, what does weight loss or calorie restriction induce weight loss? due to mitochondria, and does it perhaps relate to those improvements that we see in some of these other, other metabolic parameters? First of all, let me just say from the outset that this calorie restriction is, you know, this is not lifelong calorie restriction in humans, but this is calorie restriction induced weight loss. So this is a, um, uh, in this case, this is a, um, think about my study here, uh, 16 weeks, so four months of either exercise or calorie restriction induced weight loss. So this group lost about 8% of their body weight. So these are older people, older um, overweight and obese people. Um, volume density on EM, increase with exercise, no change with weight loss. Increase in cardiolipin as a measure of mitochondria membrane content. No effect of calorie restriction induced weight loss. Um, enzyme activity, so this is uh, NADH oxidase. So total electron transport chain activity, robust increase with exercise, um, no change, if anything, a slight decrease with weight loss. And then beta-HAD, so an enzyme involved in beta-oxidation, 
increase in um, exercise and no change with calorie restriction. And by the way, we adjusted this for uh, citrate synthase as a crude marker of either um, just TCA act cycle activity or mitochondria content. And by the way, we, we see the same thing if we adjust these results for cardiolipin as a marker of mitochondria content. You know, our study in this case was not big enough. We had about 10 in each group. The mix of men and women, they were, I can tell you that they were approximately equal in both groups. Um, we didn't, weren't powered to see a gender difference. In my current study, we will be, because we'll, we will have studied um, about 80 subjects, and I think we'll um, hopefully have at least some indications of gender differences. So cardiolipin is really interesting. Um, you know, I've, I've talked with Roger Shi over the years, and he and I had a, had a nice chat today about some of this with respect to um, cardiolipin remodeling. And so um, when I was in Pittsburgh, we did some HPLC measures of cardiolipin um, in these uh, human muscle biopsies. And so this is tetralinoleal cardiolipin, and then you've got three or four other major species of cardiolipin in skeletal muscle, and this is simply looking at an internal standard so we can quantify cardiolipin. And as it turns out, this is just proportion, percent of total cardiolipin. But when you look at subjects who exercise, there's a shift in the type of cardiolipin you have, irrespective of how much total cardiolipin is changed in the biopsy. It's not, um, you know, like super robust, but nonetheless, it's very consistent across subjects, and it's statistically significant. An increase in tetralinoleal cardiolipin with weight loss, it's just the opposite. You see a decrease in this major species and an increase in some of these species with weight loss that you see the opposite response in exercise. And if you were to compare to this to some of our, you know, our older athletes, this is exactly what we would see. That we would see in these athletes, they have about an 85% of their cardiolipin is tetralinoleal cardiolipin. So there's something about the species of cardiolipin or cardiolipin that's um, influencing function um, that um, we're just now uh, getting a better handle on. Um, so stay tuned for that. And coming back to the insulin resistance um, story, so we did hyperinsulinemic glycemic clamps on these subjects with uh, isotopic tracer, and both exercise and weight loss improve insulin sensitivity. Okay, but there's clearly a differential effect on mitochondria. So on one hand, you would say that mitochondria in, this, in the, in the uh, response to exercise correlates with improved insulin sensitivity, but you don't see the same thing with weight loss. So in, in a sense, there's a disconnect there. So in, in my current study, we're trying to come up with what is a common signature, perhaps, between weight loss and exercise that might be explaining this improvement in insulin sensitivity. And we think that oxidative stress, perhaps oxidized cardiolipin um, in the mitochondria membrane might be one of those factors. I would say in summary of the exercise and weight loss data, we would say, and this is a, you know, a magnified um, version of the electron micrograph showing mitochondria and lipid droplets, intramuscular triglyceride, but we would say that in exercise, there's more fatty acids coming into the cell, coming into the lipid droplet, more fatty acids being utilized for energy. Calorie restriction induced weight loss. You're not increasing energy demand, so there's no increased demand to, for increased fatty acid oxidation. In fact, some in most settings that we see, fatty acid oxidation in the context of weight loss itself is decreased, um, increased reliance on carbohydrate oxidation, but you get less fatty acids coming in to the cell and into the uh, lipid droplet. So really the difference is all about metabolic flux. Increase energy demand, increase metabolic flux. Here, no increase energy demand and lower metabolic flux. So in the last few minutes, um, if I have just maybe five minutes left or so, um, I want to shift gears a little bit, stay with the muscle theme, um, and talk about weight loss and weight loss with exercise in the setting of older people, but now um, look in terms of how this affects uh, the loss of muscle mass per se. Okay, so one of the questions in 
the field of gerontology is whether or not it's good or safe for older people to lose weight with calorie restriction. The fear is that they may lose too much muscle mass and this, is, this might compromise muscle function because they're already losing muscle mass with sarcopenia and if you cause them to lose weight, are they going to lose too much muscle and comprise their muscle function? So we did a study in which we um, looked at the effects of weight loss alone, so just an 8% body weight loss in 16 weeks, and in the same weight loss program, same amount of body weight loss, except adding aerobic exercise, so basically a walking program. So no difference in body weight change, but you can see here that the exercise group uh, loses significantly more body fat uh, mass, and they maintain better lean mass, fat-free mass, presumably mostly skeletal muscle. So in this study, we did see a preservation of lean mass um, in the context of diet-induced weight loss with exercise. We looked at muscle biopsies in these same subjects, and we looked at this, the change in both type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers. And we see that with just weight loss, there's a significant, and this, this is pretty dramatic actually, 15% loss in the size of type 1 fibers and about a 12% loss of type 2 fiber size with weight loss. But you can see this is completely prevented when they just walk for exercise to maintain this muscle mass. So my current study is to take the same paradigm and see if it translates into maintaining better muscle function, better muscle strength, et cetera. Now, you know, I talked about at the beginning about whether or not physical inactivity or maybe even disuse is, is a major, at least confounder, um, for the aging effects that we see on muscle mass and muscle function. And so to take it one step further, um, we got very interested in, in the question of acute disuse atrophy on muscle function, more to the question of whether or not mitochondria, mitochondrial energetics, might be implicated in, the, in muscle atrophy during acute immobilization or disuse, specifically in older people. And of course this is relevant, right, because when older people are hospitalized, um, they lose muscle mass, they lose function, and they might come out in that regard worse um, in which they started. And this is sort of depicted by this paradigm that you've probably seen many times. So this is normal aging, right? Healthy aging, normal aging. Um, what happens when you have an adverse event, hospitalization, immobilization, injury, you rehab, and then you age normally again, you have another event, you recover, probably not back up to where you were when you started, and then at some point, if you keep having these insults, you reach some threshold that you just don't recover, and whether it's you're lacking the physiological reserve or whatever you want to call it, these people don't recover, and this really strongly relates to frailty, frailty and ultimately uh, morbidity and mortality. So, um, for example, muscle loss due to hospitalization. What's the difference between one? I'll answer that later. <laughs> I could answer it now. That's okay. So, um, in comp these are two different studies, not our studies. Um, comparing 28 days of bed rest in younger people to just 10 days of bed rest in older people. So these are well-controlled bed rest studies, right? Most of these studies were funded by NASA or the European Space Agency or the Rus Russian Space Agency to look at, you know, simulate spaceflight, basically, to look at the loss of muscle. Um, it hasn't really been until more recently um, that people have gotten interested in acute disuse atrophy models in older people to really kind of simulate, you know, hospitalization. But the point here is that these younger people lose about 2% of their muscle in 28 days. The older people lose 6 to 10% of their muscle in just 10 days. So we had an opportunity to um, be involved in a study 
um, funded by Abbott Nutrition um, in collaboration with Mick Dutes at Texas A&M here and, and Bob Wolf at UAMS in, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, to look at the effects of 10 days of bed rest and recovery um, on um, some parameters of mitochondria content and function in these older people undergoing 10 days of bed rest. So the clinical study was to, to look at the effects of this um, leucine metabolite called beta-hydroxymethylbutyrate, HMB, on um, potential preservation of muscle mass. So it's, a, it's a, again, a metabolite of leucine. Um, only about 5% of leucine is converted to HMB naturally. Um, so other studies before this one had supported, at least uh, preliminarily, at the uh, efficacy of supplementing HMB to increase lean mass and strength. Um, the known mechanism of action was that, it, like leucine, would stimulate protein synthesis to the mTOR pathway. But it was also thought that it might reduce protein degradation. And so one of the questions that we had was, is there a role for mitochondria in this? So the clinical study, um, just very quickly, um, 10 days of bed rest, control group lost muscle mass, HMB preserved that loss of muscle mass. During recovery, this group recovered, so they gained their muscle mass back, but the HMB group, there was a tendency to uh, increase muscle mass further. And this translated into strength, so a loss of strength and control, preservation with HMB. Um, and then during recovery, it looked like the HMB synergized with uh, exercise to increase uh, muscle, muscle mass and strength. So our project was really to see if any of these parameters of mitochondria, um, particularly the transcription factor regulation of mitochondria biogenesis and function, might be related to um, muscle atrophy. So we did an RNA-seq uh, transcriptomic profile in the biopsies of these bed rest subjects. And so in the control subjects, we saw that among the many pathways that were downregulated with 10 days of bed rest, the pathways that are, were most affected by bed rest were those of fatty acid and lipid metabolism, and mitochondria. And when we looked at the effects of HMB on these pathways, um, and you look at the pathways that are inhibited or activated in the control group versus HMB, none of the pathways that were downregulated uh, in, in the control group with respect to fatty acid oxidation and mitochondria showed up in the HMB transcriptomic profiling, meaning that HMB prevented these, uh, the downregulation of these pathways. Yes. No, that's, that's a good question. It's not really known what the mechanism of, it, of action is. It's only been recently known by the, you know, shown by the Sabatini group you know, how, how leucine actually inter, interacts with the mTOR complex, right? And I, to my knowledge, that hasn't been done with HMB. Um, and this is just showing some of the uh, targeted RT-PCR uh, validation of some of this. So this is the control group and the white bars. So down regulation and bed rest, so the PGC1-alpha the EER gamma and alpha pathways and the PPAR alpha pathways, lipid metabolism, mitochondria, biogenesis pathways. Again, the HMB group, prevention of this downregulation. Um, so this is very preliminary unpublished data suggesting that, um, first of all, the mitochondria pathways are robustly downregulated with bed rest in association with muscle atrophy and that it could be prevented with um, this nutritional in, uh, intervention. Um, we've more recently, and this is a, this is a paper in prep, preparation right now and published, but we've looked at the effects of HMB uh, on oxidative phosphorylation proteins, as well as specific proteins, as well as some of the fission fusion proteins that I talked about earlier. And it looks to us like um, HMB is um, effect, having a dramatic effect on mitochondria content, 
uh, at least electron transport chain content, as well as some of the uh, proteins involved in uh, fission uh, uh, and, and fusion. We, um, after this study, we launched into another 10-day bed rest study. Um, again, unpublished. I'm just going to show you data from the control group here um, in this study. Same paradigm, older people, 10 days of controlled bed rest. This is oxygen flux. So this is actually um, the, diff the respiratory state ratio, complex 1 and complex 1 and 2 state uh, supported respiration, and then total electron transport chain activity determined by the Ouroboros O2K and the biopsies, showing that significantly, uh, bed rest significantly downregulates mitochondria function. So it's not just mitochondria content and mitochondria fusion, fission, uh, proteins, et cetera, but it's also the, the functional capacity of the mitochondria. And it was interesting to us that we looked at lean or normal weight versus obese subjects in this response. So the obese subjects start bed rest with significantly higher muscle mass. Um, and they lose about twice the amount of muscle during 10 days of bed rest compared to non-obese subjects. Now, whether this relates to their lower mitochondria uh, content or function, um, we're looking into that right now with continued analysis, but I think it's provocative, at least, that there's a pretty profound difference between right. obese and non-obese people. Can you measure uh, muscle mass by uh, And DEXA. Lean mass by DEXA and muscle area by CT. So when you have 10 days of rest, is there just healthy volunteers? Healthy volunteers. Okay, so there's nothing else and you put them on bed rest and do all of this in kind of the age range? Or I mean, how... 70 and above. 70 to 85. Have you ever had complications where they don't recover from the 10 days of bed rest? Every subject we've looked at so far... Um, with eight weeks of exercise following bed rest, come completely back to normal. Can you put them on any type of anticoagulation? I mean, like DVT prophylaxis and all of that? We, as we assess for DVTs before the bed rest as a risk factor. And, we, and during the bed rest, we, uh, you know, we uh, do a simple D-dimer test, and then we send them to ultrasound if there's any question. But you don't put them on any type of Well, keep in mind we're doing muscle biopsies too. No complications. Nope. <laughs> Flat in bed for ten days. Do you know if it takes uh, when this occurs? Does it take the full ten days? Is it a gradual? It's gradual. We did we did serial DEXA scan, so we we got them up. Kept them flat, put them on a, you know, a gurney, took them to the DEXA machine, did DEXA scans, CT scans. We did that serially. So they do lo lose muscle gradually. So the rate of loss of the obese, the whole 10 days is higher? Yes, just turn 10 days, yeah. It's a great question because right now we're proposing to do some time course studies to get more at mechanism. Yeah, Randy. Yes. And you see differences between different muscles uh, in bed? Yeah, I can, I can tell you that my, um, we, ha we haven't done it, but my, my colleague Scott Trappy um, has done many studies with NASA, and they've been involved in these bed rest studies over the years. Um, in fact, they just went last week to biopsy another astronaut who's going up to the space station. Um, and then when they come back, they'll get another biopsy. But they've done these bed rest studies. They do them in vastus lateralis and soleus. And what I can tell you from those studies is that soleus muscle is much more profoundly affected by disuse than vastus. And it makes sense, right? Because it's a chronically active muscle. So if you deactivate the soleus, you're going to show more of an effect. Um, and in this study, uh, the loss of lean mass over time, so, so this person is losing over two kilos of lean mass in 10 days. This is like 
the, then the mean is a, 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 about one kilo of, this is just leg lean mass. Total body lean mass is about one and a half kilos in 10 days. It's like eight years of aging in 10 days. So don't go to the hospital if you can help it. But the point here, it's strongly associated with the loss of mitochondria function. Now, what's causing what, we don't, we don't really know. So I think in summary, um, you know, this was just one slide, but I think it's pretty clear from a, from a lot of data now that strength is lost more rapidly than loss of muscle mass with aging. Um, could imply all of third muscle quality, but as was mentioned earlier, this doesn't consider, you know, central command of muscle movement or neuromuscular activation. So obviously that has, that has a role to play as well. Um, we think that the loss of mitochondria function uh, due to aging, uh, that whole concept should be challenging. We think that adiposity and physical activity are much more powerful influences on mitochondria than age per se. Um, and although disuse atrophy is Im clinically important, we don't really know what the mechanisms are at least in humans, and in our hands, this unbiased transcriptome profiling of biopsies could uh, reveal some potentially important roles of mitochondria energetics in disuse atrophy and probably even more relevant to recovery from disuse. Because um, you can only do so much with interventions during disuse. We think the action is actually about recovery. So with that, I'd be uh, happy to take any more questions and uh, appreciate your attention.